um, sort of explain it for the non-Australians in the room, I guess. Um, we sort of briefly presaged what it was, but a democracy sausage is sort of the informal name we Australians give to the fundraising um, sausage sizzles and cake stalls and craft stalls and so forth held at our polling places on election days. Um, these are usually schools, community halls, churches and so forth. It was also the word of the year in 2016 out of interest, because why not? Democracy Sausage is also the name given to a crowdsourced map of these polling booths that have the cakes, um, cake stalls and sausage sizzles and so forth. And I'm one of a plucky band of volunteers who've run the map for the past 16 Australian state and um, federal elections. And this is kind of our story. Um, it's a story of the history of where Democracy Sausage, sausage came from as a concept, um, of how the, this map came to be in the first place and what it takes to sort of run this operation as a bunch of volunteers. Um, and of some of the challenges we've um, had to solve along the way and a few challenges we haven't quite yet solved. And there's a few musings in here about the, the future of something that's very much social media driven and very much like, we don't know what's gonna happen in five or 10 or 20 years time. And so, sort of the rise of social media and everyone having these things in their pockets that they can connect and talk instantly and how that sort of plays into this space. So as far as we know, this is a uniquely Australian thing. Um, we don't know any other countries that have this sort of um, thing at the scale we do. Um, as sort of resident experts on the matter, we think it's a combination of a couple of factors. We like to barbecue things in Australia. We don't particularly mind what it is, vegetables, meat, anything. Um, and we're one of the few nation nations in the world that has compulsory voting. So you need to turn up to the polling station, you need to get your name ticked off. You don't have to actually vote, but you need to be there which makes a nice captive audience for fundraising barbecues and cake stalls, all 22 million of us or so. Um, and that fundraising bit's probably key as well. It's all going back into local communities for new sports equipment for the kids, new playground equipment, funding school camps, whatever. It's all very local focused action as well. So through some exhaustive historical research um, on Google and Trove, um, we think the first occurrence of a barbecue at a polling booth was around the 1970s. Um, we're not sure if this photo here of Gough Whitlam, our 21st Prime Minister, is actually the first occurrence, but we think it's an accurate historical representation of the art of barbecuing a sausage. <laughs> That's enough on the, the concept. I guess now we'll turn our thoughts to the map side of it, so our map. It was the night before the 2013 federal election, and all throughout the land there were barbecues being greased and onions were being diced up and so forth. A few of us were sort of gathering around red wine and beers and so forth and sort of speculating as to what would happen the next day. As it turned out, a few things did, ha did happen the next day, but that's another story. <laughs> and we thought, why is there no map of where you can go and find a good sausage the next day? Because we wanted a good sausage the next day. Um, so the idea was born. We got some laptops and we asked Google, how do you make a map really quickly in like two hours? Turned out there was some Google products, I think it was Google My Maps at the time, that sort of build your own map GUI and it wasn't much coding required, it was all quite simple. So we set up a domain name, we set up a Twitter account and cobbled together a simple map like this. And next day we sort of hopped on Twitter, looked at the Democracy Sausage hashtag, which had some traffic and just started mapping from there. We asked people to report on where they had found a cake stall or a sausage stall, and also where they hadn't found it. So that sort of absence of sausage or absence of cake, they get a big red cross of shame. <laughs> um, much to our surprise, folks jumped on board this weird thing that had occurred and they were sending us reports, they were getting involved and it was sort of weirdly just exploded from there. Um, fast forward that a couple of years and what had been a random idea was much, much bigger than any of us had expected at 10 p.m. on a Friday. Um, We'd had about three or four other sites that were sort of mapping booths. Um, some of them were trying to like review the booths for quality and stuff, and others had a few other approaches, but um, they lasted about three years and they just sort of withered away. So we're the last one standing. So a bit about the, um, I guess the, the tech and the map, uh, the map side of things as well. Given this is a mapping conference, we'll touch a little bit on that, but there isn't much tech in here. So. The first iteration of the map was this Google My Maps thing back in 2013. Um, that was okay, but there was no API. The, func it, sort of the functionality was a bit limited for us. Um, but it, we got it put together in about two, two hours, so that was okay. Um, Google released Google Maps Engine 
about a year later. So we jumped on board that, that was great, nice API, good tech, good product. When Google turned that off a year later, much to my personal and professional um, pain, <laughs> uh, we decided to look at um, Carter's builder product. So that was um, excellent at the time, we used that for a couple of years, um, but they then changed their pricing structure. So um, that wasn't gonna work for us. We had a budget of a very round figure like this, and we weren't going to pay what we needed to pay to um, use the API. So we rebuilt the map for the fourth time, I think, then. Um, Google just released their Polymer framework for JavaScript, um, and we had a nice sort of hack together PHP backend that would spit out GeoJSON for us. Um, being the good developers we are, when React turned up, and React was the hot new thing, we built it for a sixth time in React and replaced the PHP, PHP with some Python as well. So we're up to version six, and We'll see what comes after React. Um, I don't know what the hot new thing is at the moment, but maybe number seven will come up. Um, so the lesson we learned in doing all this, try not to use someone else's services if you have no money or very little money, because it's not going to work out for you. Um, and keep the tech as simple as you possibly can. Um, the moment it's just a blob of GeoJSON that gets served to a client. That's it. It sits in a cache somewhere. It's as simple as that. Um, so we try not to overcomplicate things if we can. So that's a sort of short potted history of um, this out of the way, but what does it take to actually run this, this crowdsourcing operation? Um, the core team is six people, a baby, some parrots, two snakes, some chickens, a bunch of invertebrates, um, and rabbits as well. And then a whole bunch of really hardworking volunteers apart from that. Um, we had about 20 for the last federal election around the country, um, doing various parts of the crowdsourcing operation, um, helping out in social media and so forth. We think part of the reason we managed to keep going as long as we have um, is partly the, sort of the skills our core team has. We've got people that do stats who actually work for the ABS in doing stats. Um, we've got coders, people who would like to deal with the media, people who can write really well, um, artists and creatives, um, well-connected public servants, researchers, general problem solvers, um, people who would like to project manage, th manage things, and that's all in this core team of six. So. We can spread the load around quite a bit, um, and we're quite diverse and sort of multi-skilled, and that's worked out pretty well for us. So as with all things involving, involving sausages, the real key is in how it gets made, or in our case, how we actually get the data, how we crowdsource the data. We began by literally just searching for the democracy sausage hashtag on Twitter manually and just browsing through the results there. Um, that was okay, but that wasn't gonna scale to hundreds or thousands of reports. Um, it also, also didn't take long for folks to start sending in reports to us or asking us to be listed on the map. Um, with a keen eye to making our lives easier, we quickly added a form to the site where you could submit your stall before the day. So we suddenly weren't having to deal with all the stalls on the day. We had, I think right now it's about 60% we get beforehand. Um, so on the day, it's more just sort of verifying and qualifying submissions and so forth. Um, we still do crawl many, many tweets on election day, but that's a semi-automated process for us now, so we can sort of triage it and assign certain searches and terms and so forth to various members of the, members of the team, so we're not all having to monitor the one column or the one hashtag and so forth. Um, we've also expanded beyond Twitter to Instagram and Facebook and Reddit and so forth, and that's working out pretty well. Um, the Twitter API, API is interesting if you ever had to play with it. Don't. <laughs> um, the real-time streaming is interesting. If you have to deal with that, don't. The Reddit API is nice. It's nice and simple. But that's enough talk of history and how this works. Let's um, get to probably the more interesting bit and talk about some of the challenges we've had to solve along the way that are both technical and human challenges. So our first challenge is one you're probably all familiar with from your own work, getting the data in the first place. You'd think pulling both data is pretty fundamentally simple, right? It's got a coordinate, it's got an address, probably got a name of some sort as well. Yeah, we've got nine electoral commissions doing state, territory, and federal elections in Australia. Um, they manage over process overseeing and running elections and making sure everything goes properly. Um, you might think they've all got a roughly the similar approach to publishing polling booth data, maybe the same schema, maybe even some standards around how they publish polling booth data, common names and so forth. Uh, 
No. <laughs> Definitely not. But they have, they have got addresses in common. They've all got an address field. That's about it. Um, some of them give us nice spreadsheets with all the columns we need and coordinates and everything else and nicely structured addresses. Um, but others will just list it on their website across various pages and have only addresses, not coordinates. Uh, more recently, some have done handy sort of find your own polling booth, booth maps, but often there's no nice machine-readable data source behind the map or there's no public ABI for it. So we're left trying to scrape it or find the right person to ask um, for the data. And none of them use the same schema. It's all some other different local variation they've got. So our solution, make friends. Go around frontline customer service and go around sort of the, the public contact point and just find the GIS person or the person that knows how to use QGIS there and say, hey, we're doing a mapping thing. Can we have your shape file? Simple as that. Um, on a serious note for the, moment, for the moment, we love the work the, commi the commissions do, but their job is not to give a bunch of random spatial data. Their job is to run elections. So <laughs> it's fair enough. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> So our second challenge is one you'll also be familiar with, poor quality data. We think there's a pretty interesting challenge in polling booth data that's, I think, reasonably unique. Um, to us, as people that map polling booths, um, having the exact coordinate is super important. Having an address that's well-structured and logical is super important. Um, accurate building names and so forth. But to the electoral commissions themselves, that's actually not as important. Much of their organizing happens on a very local level. So you know where the local school is or the local community hall is. You know what it's called. You don't need to know exactly where it is on the ground. Um, that works OK until you start trying to map them at a national scale and you start getting more eyes on the data you've got. And then you end up with a bunch of interesting issues. You have things like polling booths that are actually in the middle of the ocean off Queensland because there's a five where there should be a three in the coordinates. Or a polling booth that's in North America because there's no minus there's no minus sign where it should be in the coordinates, so it's in it's in Idaho, not in Central Queensland. Um, or polling booths have the right coordinates, the right name, and the right address, but the wrong postcode, so it mucks up your sort of data cleansing routines. That's like match this postcode to this thing, error. So our solution: a lot of time writing a very complex set of data validation routines that try and fix all this stuff up, try and use past polling booth locations to predict the accuracy of the current one you've got, and then try and automate that as much as possible. Because we do, for most elections, 12 to 24 ingests, ingests between election being declared and election day itself, because there's new cuts every couple of days as you know, the local community hall is being renovated, so we're using the public school. So we lose one booth, we add one booth. So that sort of continual ongoing automation is pretty key for us. So our third, our third challenge here really is around the crowdsourcing side of things. So we began, as I say, by just searching the hashtag manually, um, but that wasn't going to scale. You can only have six people around the table looking at so many columns in TweetDeck, and for that becomes completely, utterly unworkable, and you end up just arguing and shouting about, are you responding to that guy yet? No, I thought you were. So it doesn't work. So we did what every sensible team would do, and built our own damn social media management tool. <laughs> Um, Customised for us, we've got sort of triaging functionalities. We can assign tasks to people. They get notifications. It's basically Hootsuite, but customised for us. We tried using Hootsuite, but again, the cost was too big for something that runs twice a year and has no budget. So, and again, I guess the human side of that as well. So, we started out with about six of us trying to run this, um, but with growing popularity, we were facing thousands and then tens of thousands of posts on Twitter and. Reddit and Facebook and so forth. Um, our solution was ask our friends, then ask them to ask their friends, and then friends of those friends, and then we just had no more friends left. And then we asked, asked on social media, do you want to help out with sausage? It's fun. We'll send you some stickers if you help out. Um, and before we knew it, we had 20 people on the team for the last election, and we were doing more work, sort of, I guess, wrangling volunteers, writing on boarding packs, setting up rosters, making sure that they knew what they were doing when and that they'd read the onboarding pack and then the questions about the onboarding pack um, and making sure they're having fun doing it because that's, that's why we do this thing. It's fun, we enjoy it, um, it's a good luck. So with popularity also comes attention. 
um, and in our case, requests from other sites to access the data we've been crowdsourcing. Um, it's like when you wake up in the morning and suddenly you're a provider for Google and Twitter and Facebook and the political parties, and you have no budget and you're just doing it at night when you get home from work. Um, so our solution, throw together an API very, very quickly um, with actual access controls and some documentation that's not just in your head, and then ask your large partners to please bear with you because it's 10 o'clock at night and you need to sleep. Or do that tomorrow, Google. <laughs> the last one is also, I guess, partly caused by the explosion in popularity, but partly a um, factor that contributes to it, um, and that's media interest. Uh, when, we, when we began, we had requests from newspapers and websites and so forth for stats and lists of, you know, what's the most popular polling booth in this electoral division? That was pretty easy to handle, but then as things got more popular, we ended up with an ABC camera crew in the land room of our HQ filming us on our computers for some reason. Um, on air interviews with CNN because they like a colour story in Australia, so that was good. Um, journos from the BBC and The Economist calling for comment, very serious comment. Um, and we've done way more local radio interviews than we ever thought possible. There's so many local radio stations in Australia and they all care deeply about their local polling booths and the colour stories and so forth. Um, it's all a bit surreal, really. <laughs> Our solution has been find the core team, people that like to do the media thing, and then just let them practice it and practice it and practice it and practice it and practice it, and, practice it, and they get really good. There's only many a pros. So there's a couple of challenges yet to solve. <laughs> we haven't, haven't solved that one yet. <laughs> um, a bigger one is, is uh, address geocoding. Um, that's our biggest expense by several orders of magnitude. Um, the last election was about $1,000 in address geocoding services. Um, again, our budget is nothing, basically. So um, people are so used to having the address search bar at the top that we can't not have one, but um, we also can't really pay for one. So we're still trying to work out how we tackle that. Um, right now, we just sort of beg and borrow credits on Google um, map services, and that's working okay, but we'd like a long-term solution to that as well. Um, might involve GNAF, Hugh, if you want to maybe build a geocoder into that. <laughs> um, secondly, is a big one for us is rate limiting, on, rate limiting on social media. Our accounts, particularly Twitter, have a really weird usage pattern where they do this and then this and then this a couple of times a year. That looks like spam behavior to most social media platforms. Suddenly nothing and then a whole bunch of posting and replying in six hours. So we often get rate limited or at worst temporarily banned. Um, haven't got a solution to that yet, apart from very asking Twitter very nicely and asking people very nicely to raise the rate limits just for this day. But that's, again, not a long-term solution. We're also not really equipped to support more social media platforms. We can just about handle the four we've got, but we're not set up to cope with other fragmentation of those platforms into further communities or an increase in the number of platforms overall. If you're interested in helping us solve these as well, let us know. We're not after like technical people or anything, just enthusiasm. Um, and if you know folks that can help us solve any of those three, also let us know. So lastly, there's a couple of challenges we haven't um, had to solve yet, we think, but we can see them coming. First one's vandalism and spam. We've had one spam report in the past six years, and we're not sure why because there's no real protection against it. We can't verify them, but there's nothing to stop you just sending in thousands of reports or sending in subtly fake reports, but no one has, which is weird because it's the internet. <laughs> People are nice, I don't know. We'd be curious to work it out. Um, we thought twice about even mentioning this because we thought someone might actually then go and do it. <laughs> so if it happens, I've got 200 people I know I can look at. And this is our big sort of risk. So there's been an increase in pre-poll voting in Australia, particularly at state elections. Um, we think our compulsory voting probably shelters us from this somewhat, um, but we're not quite sure how long it's, how long it's gonna last for. And this sort of explosion in the popularity of, um, of the meme of democracy sausage, um, it's probably happened at the same point where there's been a decrease in polling with attendance. So we think they're probably offset each other at some point. 
um, we keep thinking it's always going to get, like, this is as big as it gets. There's no election that will be bigger than this election. And then the next election is bigger still. Um, so it's been curious to see. Um, for us, the risk is we stop doing a fun map and that's that. But the risk is quite real for the groups that rely on this for fundraising. Like, how are the kids going to get new play equipment or go to a, a sports carnival if suddenly you're not making five grand on a barbecue a couple of times a year? So we'll see where that goes. But as long as there's a request for it, we'll keep mapping these things. So that's our story of a plucky band of somewhat crazy volunteers. The inclusion of a quite uniquely Australian thing, we think, um, and this rise of social media and sort of these things being in our pockets and making it easy. We do what we do, I guess, to celebrate democracy, if that's not too ostentatious. Um, encourage, encourage sort of participation in that process and really just to um, support the local community groups and what they're doing, making their efforts more visible and so forth. And we hope we make elections a little bit more fun and a little bit less depressing. Um, maybe not the last one. So if you're eligible to vote in Australia, um, remember that real friends don't just go to the map and pick a good booth. They go to a missing data point, risk not getting a sauce or cake, and report it to us. <laughs> so please do that. We've we had, had some folks do road trips as well. So if you want to do a road trip around a bunch of missing data points, that's also cool. We'll send you some stickers. Speaking of, please buy the merch. It pays for service. The stickers and T-shirts. Thank you. All right, that was fantastic. I'm guessing there'll be quite a few questions. So raise your hand if you've got one. I'll come around with the mic. Got one there, one there. One. Okay, we'll start over there and then move over here. Um, have you done any analysis on polling booth results and presence or type of food that was served? We don't have at least one paper that's been published, given some data we've provided. Um, we haven't tried ourselves because we're usually just exhausted by the time it's over and we're like, oh, it's done. <laughs> don't want to think about it again. Um, but yeah, there has been some actual academic research on that. Um, I think if you Google for our website, you'll find the references. I think it might be on the About page. Hello. Um, awesome talk. Um, amazing collection of photos of prime ministers eating Thank and you. cooking sausages. <laughs> um, sort of two questions based on the the panel discussion about communities this morning. Hmm. Um, first, like, what is preventing burnout in this community? Is it just that it doesn't happen too often? And secondly, um, is your community? Do you think at the point where you would survive the transition of the initial founders? Like, if you left, would it carry on without you? No, it would burn and die. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have one and a half developers. I'm one of those developers. Um, that's the big risk from my point of view. Um, yeah, it's all on GitHub. Notionally, it's all open source, and I've mostly documented how it works, but there's also a bunch of goop sitting on DigitalOcean that only, only I have access to. Um, I'd like to solve that. If there's more developers that would like to contribute, I'm very happy. It's all modern TypeScript, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I'd like to solve that. But the tech bit is entirely reliant on me. Um, as to burnout, yeah, it only happening a couple of times a year is a big part of it. Um, a federal election for us is about three months of planning and work. So we're, we're done by the end of it. We don't want to think about this for a long time. Um, I think the most, the busiest year has been four elections in one year and that was a bit too much. Um, yeah, we're just quite fortunate we chose the right thing that doesn't have a very concentrated set of events to manage. Otherwise, it'd be too much, yeah. Have you thought about a mobile app to help with collecting location data, anonymized, optional location data to help? Yeah, okay. As in, install the app on your phone yeah. and then what you, you report it from there? Yeah, well, when you report a location, yes, they've got this here. Yep. No, they haven't. It also sends the location based off your phone's location. What's the benefit? I mean, like, they, they can use geolocation in their browser already. Yeah. Or like, like on the ground level bits of where the actual stall is. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to build the app? Go for it. <laughs> How, 
Have you had any feedback from the organisations that are doing the uh, sizzles um, and saying thank you? Uh, we've actually increased our sales because of, uh, of the uh, site. We've had and, some really... And do you get a cut? <laughs> That's a good idea, yeah. Um, <laughs> that would help pay for servers, actually. Um, we've had some really heartwarming emails from folks saying, hey, we were on the map and we saw a, a, like a big increase from the last election. Um, that's great, thank you so much. It helped us do whatever it is they were doing locally. Um, that's part of why we keep doing it, because it seems to actually make an impact beyond it just being a, a fun, random project that lives on social media. Um, we have, have had butchers try and get us to be like promotion for them, for their sausages. Not quite realising that we do a whole country and no one cares what the local Ipswich butcher <laughs> is selling. That's, that's, also, that's also one route we could take, is, yeah, sponsorship. Yeah. Does the app or the, the website right now guide you from where you are? Two questions. Does it guide you to the location? As in, like, directions? Yes. Um, no, we'd thought of doing it. Um, my first instinct would be if we can open a link to whatever the native mobile mapping app you've got is, that's probably better for us because I don't want to deal with directions. And again, that would be an API cost for us on top of address searching. Um, no one's asked for it yet. Uh, we've always just assumed that they're always going to a local polling booth so they know where the school is or where the community hall is. So maybe they don't need directions. Um, that's a good question. Maybe there is a need for it. The second question is, have you thought about what three words into reading that? So you know where on the... If it was open, I would. It's not. <laughs> okay. So... It's free to a certain level though, right? To a certain level, yeah. I, I have philosophical issues with, with what three words. Okay. <laughs> shall we say. If there was a nice open standard that wasn't, wasn't what three words or um, so forth, we'd look at that, yeah. Is that the Google thing? Yeah, are people using it out of interest? Um, no. no? <laughs> I think in Utah, it's okay. Yeah, could totally add it if we can look at a way to compute it. 